Thank you, Encounter Band. Thank you, Encounter Band. And we are back. Y'all, we are blazing through the Bible. Did y'all know that next week we're going to be in the New Testament? We're almost done with the Old Testament. This is the week that we're talking about the prophets, which is the last major section of the Bible. So this is where we've been. We have the Pentateuch, the history books, the wisdom books, the prophets. Those are the four main sections of books in the Old Testament. And when you, when you open to a passage and start reading, if you get an idea of where you are and why you're there, it will give you an idea of how to interpret it. You're going to interpret something in the wisdom books much differently than you would if it appeared in the histories, per, for example. So this morning, I want to talk a little bit about the role of the prophet. The prophet was one of the three major characters of the Old Testament throughout all of Israelite history. Um, the, the three major characters were prophet, priest, and king. The priests were introduced in Leviticus. The family of Aaron and all of his descendants were were to be the priestly family. Um, The kings were introduced starting with Saul and David and then Solomon. We talked about that. And then there were kings throughout the rest of Israel's history until the exile. The third major category was the prophet. And the prophet was the one who brought a word from God. And the prophets were operating all throughout those historical books and later. And what we have in the section of books called the prophets that we're going to get to are the writings of some of those prophets. Now, it's interesting, when you, when you get the timeline in your head and you go back and you read some of the historical books, you can see the time period when some of these prophets would have been preaching, and then you can flip, 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 flip to the actual prophet and see some of the sermons that he preached. It's great once, once you know that's what it is. But a lot of the prophets that we see in the historical books didn't actually um, write books later. And so all we hear of them is, is what appears in the historical books. So names like Elijah, if that rings a bell, Elisha, all of those are prophets. But because they did not write a book... What we have of them only appears in the historical books. We don't actually have a section in the, in the prophetic literature of the Bible. When we come to this section of the Bible, what we are reading are the sermons that were preached to the people of God centuries ago. The prophet was the one who brought a word from God, much in the same role, a preacher would bring a word from God today. A prophet was not primarily supposed to be a future teller. A prophet was not primarily supposed to be a fortune teller. Uh, What we're going to get into with these books is these books can be misunderstood as the um, horoscope of the Bible, right? So I see people do this more than any other section of the Bible. They open their Bible randomly to Isaiah, because Isaiah has a lot of things in it. They read a section, and they're like, oh, this is for me today. And the thing is, there is a sense in which you can hear those words spoken to us. I'm going to get to that at the very end, but we have to first understand these in their own context, because otherwise we're going to completely misunderstand them. Um, There was a story about a church planter who opened to the part of Isaiah where it says, I shall call my children from the north and the south. And so then he realized, uh, he decided he was going to go plant his church in a place where it could draw from the north and the south of the city. Which isn't, I don't think, exactly what God was meaning when he originally said these words through Isaiah. The first thing we have to do with the prophets, because we are reading preachers, is understand what these would have meant in their original place and time. Prophets were not fortune tellers or not future tellers. Every now and then, they would say something that would predict something in the future. Because the, the standard that we are given in actually back in the Pentateuch of how to know if a prophet is from the Lord is whether or not something they say comes to pass. And if a prophet says something and you have to wait 2,000 years for it to come to pass, you've lost the validity of that test. And so every prophet, when they said something, unless it was obviously meant to be a long time in the future, when they said something, it was intended primarily for the generation at their time. And so when we go back, even in Isaiah, all those predictive texts were meant to be for that generation at that time. 
Now what has happened is people will go back later and they will see, yes, this, this happened at this time for this generation, but this also foreshadowed something else God was doing, which is how we interpret a lot of the Isaiah texts that reference something that happened at that time and also what we believe happened in Jesus. So there are different layers of things happening, but if we do not read the prophets primarily and primarily as preachers who were speaking to their time, to their place, we are going to run the risk of treating the Bible like our personal horoscope. And the problem with that is sometimes it's going to work out and sometimes it's not. It's going to be completely luck of the draw because you're not actually interacting with it as the word of God. You're interacting it the same way you interact with the fortune teller. So, prophets. What I want to walk with you is I want to walk through briefly what the prophets said and why, so that when we do read these books on our own, we can interpret them wisely, because interpreted wisely, these books do contain some of the most powerful um, pieces of scripture, most powerful and inspiring and poetic. There's a reason people gravitate toward these books, at least parts, parts of them. These are also the books where there's a whole lot of hellfire and brimstone. You don't hear those preached as much. But the reason people gravitate to some of the more inspiring parts of this book is because these orators were beautifully spoken people who could compose words that would inspire people and have inspired people for thousands of years. And there is great value in that if we interpret them correctly. Okay, so when you're in the prophets, and I'm going to speak mostly about the written prophets because what, what this series is supposed to do is help you understand the parts of your Bible. And we're in this, this section of books is called the prophets. This comes right after Song of Solomon. That's the last book of the wisdom books. And we start first with Isaiah. When you open the prophets, you will come first to Isaiah, then to uh, Jeremiah, then to Ezekiel, then Lamentations, which is a smaller book that was written by Jeremiah, then to Ezekiel, then to Daniel. Those are, in Christian tradition, the four what we call major prophets. Major prophets does not mean they are more important. It means they wrote more words. Um, Isaiah is the longest of all the prophets, 66 chapters. It's a, it's a heck of a book to try to conquer. Um, Jeremiah is also quite lengthy. Ezekiel is quite lengthy. Daniel is actually less lengthy, but it is considered a major prophet for the Christians because he talks so much about the Son of Man, the Chosen One, the Messiah. There are so many Messianic references in Daniel, we just decided to count him as a major prophet anyway, um, even though he was not nearly as long as Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. After that, we go into 12 minor prophets, again, who are not minor because of their import. They're minor simply because their books are shorter. Some of them only a chapter or two, some of them up to 12 chapters. But that, the 12 minor prophets, then take us through the end of the Old Testament. So once you finish the prophets, you are, you are done with the Old Testament. Congratulations. So what do these prophets say and what did they say in their own time and place? They were preachers. Oh, the other thing you should know about prophets is that they were overwhelmingly hated. I should throw that in. <laughs> they were almost universally despised. So if you remember the, the, three, the three categories, the three major characters were prophet, priest, and king. The priests and the kings were kind of, they were the ones who kept society going. So they were the ones in the center of society. They had the most political and financial power. Um, the kings were all corrupt. The priests weren't necessarily all corrupt, but they were definitely in the centerpiece of, of society. They, they had a lot of money. They had a lot of prestige. They were, they were trying to protect society and keep it going. Um, the king and the priest were often on the same side. The prophet was the guy dressed in camel's hair, <laughs> living in the wilderness, who came back and he said, you guys are doing it completely wrong. And then he wondered why nobody liked him, right? Uh, the prophets were given a word from God to preach to those people in power often. Um, and so they would set themselves against the kings, calling out kings, calling out priests, 
for acts of hypocrisy and for not living up to the standard presented in God's law. And because of that, the prophets very often, not just were not liked, they were physically persecuted. The number of prophets that were killed in the Old Testament, I don't, I don't even know off the top of my head, a lot of them. Um, in fact, when you hear Jeremiah get his call, he's like, really? <laughs> Are you sure, God? <laughs> he's a priest. He's also called to be a prophet, and he is not happy about that fact because he knows how hard prophets have it. Because when they bring a word of the Lord, it's not always welcome. Um... Okay, so what were they preaching? Overwhelmingly, the prophets were preaching two things. The first is this. If you do not do what you have been called to do, there will be dire consequences for you. This is the hellfire and brimstone preaching. And we like, I, I know we like to pretend it's not in the Bible, but it is. A lot of it is. And the prophets are very, very directly trying to get people's attention. If you do not know, do what you are supposed to do, there will be consequences. Now, when I say do what you're supposed to do, that falls broadly into two categories. The first category is um, not worshiping God. So this is the, the foundation of the covenant is I am the Lord your God. You are my people. I will be the Lord your God. You will be my people. You will have no other gods before me. That's the foundation of everything. Um, it's, it's like a wedding ceremony. Um, I do, I do, we're going to be married to each other, and it doesn't work well if you say that and you go off and you try to marry all these other people. The foundation of the covenant was worship of God alone. And so the first thing that these prophets were trying to call people back to was worship of God alone. And the number of ways in which people would slide away and begin to worship other gods were so many that they could hardly be counted. Now, when we talk about this today... Um, I, I still do believe that this worship of God alone is one of the most important messages that needs to be preached to today's congregations, but we tend not to do it by actually literally building an altar to a foreign God in our house. Sometimes we do, um, but sometime, most of the time, it is a far more subtle sense of idolatry in which you and I prioritize anything except for God. So we pay lip service to our worship of God, but in fact, with our money and with our time and with our energy, we are worshiping something that is far lesser than God. The prophets say, don't, if you don't do what you're supposed to do, there's going to be consequences. First half of that is worship of God. The second half of that is treatment of people. The prophets are the most overt group to call out um, people for oppressing or in some way mistreating their neighbor. And so you have prophets who are calling out um, practices in the marketplace where they would use unfair, uh, they, would, they would basically weight their scales. And so if someone came and bought a certain amount of grain, they weren't getting the certain amount of grain for the, uh, the money that they paid. Um, the, you have people who are calling out um, practices in which uh, Poor people are uh, losing their only clothing because they had a loan that they couldn't repay, repay and so uh, they would take their clothing away as repayment for the loan. The prophets are calling that out. You have prophets over and over and over again throughout the entire, the corpus of the prophetic literature calling out people for not treating each other the way uh, God had prescribed treatment of neighbor in the law. And so because of that, when you read through the prophets, you hear things that might surprise you. Um, but there's, I mean, there are sections where they even imply your worship of God is meaningless if you're not also loving your late neighbor. So don't, don't come worship me and then go cheat your neighbor because they go hand in hand. And so those two, those two different tiers together, worship the Lord alone, treat your neighbor well, are the backbone of everything that the prophets preach. And the first big section of prophecy is if you don't do that, there are going to be consequences. Specifically in most of the prophetic literature, they're talking about the, up, the impending exile, although there are smaller consequences along the way. But the word is, if you do not do what you are supposed to do, you're going to regret it. Now, I do want to say this. I am not intending to become a hellfire and brimstone preacher. 
And yet, I do think that there is a reason that the Bible uses negative language when it does. Because the truth of the matter is the way human beings work, first of all, if we only ever use positive language, you will not see it as important as it actually is. So if I go to you and I say, you know what? You should work out because it makes you feel wonderful and energetic and healthy. Some of you might say, great, I'll do it. Some of you might say, oh, that's nice. I also feel wonderful when I eat a donut and don't work out. In fact, I feel more wonderful when I eat a donut and don't work out. And for some of you, I will not get your attention until I say, you know what happens when you don't work out? Is your muscles atrophy, you lose energy, your body starts breaking down, you become more tired, you hear how many negative words I'm using, but they're all true. And for some of you, it's not until you hear the negative consequences of what might happen immediately in your life that you start to actually think it's important and worth listening to. Human psychology has not changed. And the truth of the matter, folks, this is true and has been true. The spiritual choices that you make in your life are relevant and have consequences. And if we live as though there is no God, it will have consequences in our immediate spiritual lives. And if we treat our neighbors as though there is no God, it will have consequences in our immediate spiritual lives. And you will not like them. Because you were not created to be a person who lives as though there is no God or who treats your neighbor as though there is no God. And if we think those are inconsequential behaviors, in fact, they are not. God gets very, very protective, in fact, of rich people who do not care about poor people. That's a theme that goes on in the prophets. And God will say, these are mine. Do not mess with my children. But you know what? If all that was said in the prophets were, if you care for the poor among you, you will do well among God. You will do well with God. You will do well. If that was all that was said, you wouldn't get people's attention. But if God says, don't mess with my kids or I will spit you out of my mouth, you get their attention. Does this make sense to people? So I don't know how you work psychologically, but I would suspect you're a bit of both. I would suspect that the positive language inspires you, and I would also suspect that you need a little bit of ne negative language to get you motivated to actually realize that it is important. The bulk of what you're going to read in the prophetic language, in prophetic literature is actually negative. The bulk of what you're going to read is actually judgment and warning. And I think that we cheat ourselves when we skip straight to the positive promises at the end without reading any of the warnings that preceded them. Because what we're doing is we're making ourselves think that we can fall in line with God just by clinging to his promises without actually heeding in our souls the ramifications of what would happen if we don't. This is part, you remember when I said people use the prophets as a horoscope? I see more people who have Isaiah 40 memorized, but they can't tell me a single verse of Isaiah 1 through 39. Because 1 through 39 is pretty hard stuff. And I'm not saying you have to memorize it. Maybe you should read it. Maybe you should read it. Maybe we should take into our consideration all of what the prophet said. So obviously the second corpus of things, so the first grouping of things they said is don't do what you're not supposed to do because there will be consequences. The second is that if you do what you are supposed to do, the rewards will be beyond your wildest imaginations. The blessings will be beyond your wildest imaginations. And this is where the true beauty of the prophets come through. These people knew how to inspire people. And so all throughout the prophets, especially at the ends of some of these books, you hear the talk of the new heavens and the new earth. You hear the promises of God. You hear the, the, the hope of God. You hear the hope of restoration. The, there's a break between Isaiah 39 and Isaiah 40, where the exile occurs. And Isaiah 1 through 39 is God going, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I, have, I realize how this sounds as a parent now, because I say this so, you do that one more time, I promise I am taking that toy away. I'm going to do it. 
I'm going to do it. (laughs) And then what happens in Isaiah 40, after it happens, is the tone completely changed, and it starts, comfort, oh, comfort my people. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem, for she has paid double for all of her sins. And when I read that verse, I literally now hear myself holding my crying child saying, it's okay, it's okay, it's okay, it's going to be okay, it's going to be okay. And the thing is, I am their parent in both of those circumstances. God was the parent in both of those circumstances. But if you only read Isaiah 40, then you don't get the full context of what happened. What happens in the promise, in, in the whole context of the prophets, is God is holding, God through these prophets is holding us to account for who we are, for the worst of who we are, and promising us what can happen if we actually, if we actually are the people he called us to be. Giving us a vision of what can happen, what we can become, what he will do with us and through us if we actually are the people we are supposed to be. And that language is some of the most beautiful you've ever read in your life. Isaiah chapter 43, I've beat up a lot in Isaiah today, but Isaiah is one of the most important and one of the most gorgeous books ever penned in the Bible. And I want to tell you a story. When I was in high school, um, one of my mother's very good friends, who was also one of, um, she was the prayer partner who was assigned to me in confirmation. Those of you who think confirmation kids don't remember their their prayer partners or mentors, we do. I still remember it was my first adult contact who was not my my parents in my childhood, right? So there were teachers, but this was the first grown-up friend I had who was not attached to my parents. And I remember she used to, she would take me out to ice cream all by myself. I felt so grown up. Um, I got through confirmation. The next year, she got a cancer diagnosis. And she and my mom were about the same age, so they spent a whole lot of time together. Um, I don't know what all went into their conversations together, but I know that um, they prayed a lot. I know that they had a lot of just turning things over to God. I remember the, the time when um, she shaved her head because she was about to lose her hair, and my mother was sitting there, and they were, they were talking about it together. And my mother said, do you remember when we used to care about how our hair looked? <laughs> And it was just a different world, right? That's what cancer does. It, it, it puts all the things you used to worry about in perspective. And they prayed, and they prayed, and they prayed, and they just were going on that journey together. And one day, my mother made a bouquet to take over to her house, and it was a bouquet of scripture passages, almost exclusively drawn, drawn from the prophets, thinking back on this. And everyone was written on a little heart, handwritten, and put on a stick coming out of a flower pot, like a bouquet. But every single one of them was a scripture verse. And this is one of the ones that I know was on there, because I memorized it after after seeing it, on that um, scripture bouquet. This is Isaiah 43, verse 1. But now, thus says the Lord, He who created you, O Jacob, He who formed you, O Israel, Do not fear, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name. You are mine. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the rivers, they will not overwhelm you. When you walk through fire, you shall not be burned. And the flame shall not consume you. For I am the Lord your God, the Holy One of Israel, your Savior. I give Egypt as your ransom, Ethiopia and Seba in exchange for you, because you are precious in my sight and honored, and I love you. Now friends, when that was originally written, it was written to people who were sitting in a time of exile who weren't sure if God had abandoned them or not. And my mom knew that, my mom has taught Bible since I've been alive. And they knew what had Isaiah 1 through 39 had said. They'd they'd done their work of making sure that they were on God's path and repenting and putting themselves, you know, God-centered instead of self-centered. But knowing that history, knowing where it had been, 
did not stop these words from being relevant to them, even as it was also relevant to people thousands of years ago. You see, that this is why it's in the Bible. It is important to know the history, but these are not dead words. This is not a dead message. This is a message that comes to life again every time the Holy Spirit breathes through us and brings us back to our scriptures and speaks the word anew. I don't know how many people across the face of the earth that that particular promise has been relevant to, but I would bet you that I couldn't count them if I did. Because God spoke those words initially through this prophet, and because they were written down, speaks them again, and again, and again, and again. And they never stop being true. When you pass through the waters, I will be with you. And through the floods, they shall not overwhelm you. You are precious in my sight. And I love you. Friends, the word of the Lord that comes to you through the ancient words of the prophets of old, has not changed. Do not take for granted that which you do, because that which you do is more powerful than you can com possibly comprehend. And so do not take lightly when you are committing the ancient sins of idolatry and taking your neighbor for granted. Do not take that lightly, but also do not take lightly God's never-ending, never-stopping love for you. God's thirst to call you back into covenant relationship with him. God's desire to make you into the person you were called to be. And God's promise to see you through every day until the end finally comes. That promise was true then. It is true now. And it will be true until the day finally comes when God pulls a curtain on creation. And the new heavens and the new earth are complete. And that is why we have kept and we still have the voices of these prophets in our Bible. Would you join with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, giver of all good gifts, creator of all that is, you who have whispered to us from ages past, you have, who have drawn us to yourself, you who have invited us into a greater story than we can possibly imagine, forgive us when we have seen ourselves as the centerpiece of the story. And bring us instead into a place we are, where we are called into a deeper, more authentic relationship with you. God, forgive us when we have not seen our neighbor as a child of God. Forgive us when we have not seen the human beings with whom we share this planet as children of God. And forgive us when we have not behaved in ways that honor the people around us and honor you. And forgive us also when we have given in to despair, thinking that our choices are the end of the story and there is no hope beyond, because we, we trust God not in our righteousness, but in your grace to bring us into your future and to bring us into your promise. Come Holy Spirit, create in us the hearts you wish to see this morning. This we pray in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit as we say together the prayer our Lord taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen.